Thanks for everyone for coming. Really, really kind of everyone to come. Uh, something which uh, I guess I'm, I'm interested in. And uh, Hi. Hi. <laughs> Anything of interest? <laughs> Um, so one of the one of the disadvantages of being in this in the system is that uh, you have to make phone calls to check up about the girl, and uh, most of the phone calls go like this. It's like, uh, yeah, she's such a bad chesed. She's so amazing. She's you know the most amazing girl. She's got amazing middles, and everyone says the same thing. Which is like, <laughs> thank you. <laughs> Um, but occasionally what you can do is, uh, if you ask specific questions, then then uh, you can get a bit of clarity on what the person is, but of course it could be that they're, you know, hopefully, hopefully not, but they could be lying. Um, but the only way to get to get around that is to, um, to call someone else up and ask specific questions, and then if they answer the same thing, you know, you can cross-reference and you can see that, you know, there's some sort of truth going on, on here. So we didn't see, we didn't see what Daddy was going to say, you know, and this is what Michael was going to say, but uh, what Daddy said was uh, it's going to be a bit similar. But, uh, but he, why, why I can see is that this is, this is the truth. This is, this is the, the man my grandfather was. So it's a few fun memories. I just uh, say, which I remember was Grandpa's tool shed. It was always an amazing experience to go in there and see all these crazy tools, which, yeah, it's scary. <laughs> machines. But uh, yeah, he was always in control. It was good. Uh, I remember him trying to teach us how to uh, make an egg. Um, it was me and Mike in the kitchen, and he um, he got this egg, and he said, you know, break an egg. How do you break an egg? So we weren't sure, so he first tried on Mikey's head, <laughs> which didn't work, and then tried on my head, which didn't work, and then he smacked it on his head. <laughs> he was balding by then, so it was very funny. Um, and basically, he was a handyman. I remember him making us uh, like a scooter. Um, and had to spray paint it in the backyard is you know, just a lot of fun to, to do that. You know, I really took advantage of those, of those moments, um, which was great. Um, you know, I remember coming before the Simcha, he was always taking pictures, you know, taking everything in. You know, he was just you know, he was blown away by everything that was going on. Um, the zoo trips. Um, and uh, something which, when I went to Australia, I, you know, I rented to go to Australia with Daddy last year, um, you know, when he was in the hospice. So um, one of the things which I, uh, which everyone was saying to me, which was, you know, Grandpa was a good man. I don't know if that's like an Australian expression, but <laughs> that's what everyone, everyone said the same thing, was that, you know, he was a good man, he did the right thing. Um, and I could see, he was in the hospice, um, he was sitting there, there was like another, another, another you know, couple there, and, uh, you know, he was like listening to this, this family like talked to him for like half an hour about their troubles. You know, he's in the hospice. <laughs> like, and he was just like listening patiently, saying yes. And, you know, this is them trying to make small talk and trying to you know like, in the hospice. Which I was... He did occasionally take his hearing aid out. Though. <laughs> <laughs> you know, a little good nodding. You know, kind of... <laughs> but uh, you know, to give someone that time, especially when you're all short on time, uh, was, was, was uh, an amazing lesson for me. Uh, you know, the fact that he, he left, you know, he, he wanted to go to, you know, to college and, uh, you know, he did to help support the family, he couldn't go and he, you know, decided to do the right thing, which was like to go out and help support the family. Um, and, you know, he probably didn't, didn't see to eye to eye in, you know, the whole religious thing, but um, I saw him as, you know, a, you know, his Jewish identity and what got him a heart was he was, I think he was a very religious man at heart. He, um, the kind of the kind of things which um, which got to him, which I saw him, you know, get emotional about. Um, you know, just talks about his his lave was um, was uh, was about this kind of stuff. Um, I remember one of, one of the lessons which I learned. Two, two lessons which I think I learned from him. And I love this is that one is that his sirut um, nefesh for for Judaism is the fact that he you know he, he didn't get a chance to go to college, and you know he had to you know work all these you know. He had to be a taxi driver, he had to run a shop, and he had to pay off debts to like send, you know, pay down to, um, to to Jewish schools, which doesn't sound like an easy thing. Um, but it was important to him, especially someone who you know went to the Holocaust or who was uh, you know a son of uh, parents who were Holocaust survivors, had to go through, you know, what he had to go through, and to still want his kids to, you know, um, have that Jewish identity. Um, you know, it's, it's, I think that's an amazing thing. Um, that is that I remember taking him to the sons of the Tanya, the sons of the the, the Tishta, 
remember him saying like it was unbelievable. We kept saying it was unbelievable, and then he said, you know, if, you know, if Hitler was here, you know, what would he, what would he do? Uh, you know, at like the Kota, you could, you, I asked him once. Last time he was here, I asked him he wanted to go to the Kota. He said, no, I can't go because he's making me cry. <laughs> <laughs> Um, so I saw him as a profoundly, you know, in, in his own way, he was very religious in his life. He, he had his very, very strong Jewish identity, which I think, you know, people passed on. Um, and the, the, the last lesson which I, which I saw, which was, you know, in the hospice, is that seeing someone, you know, a hospice is a place where, you know, that's, that's the end. You know, everyone, when a person goes there, that's what they feel is the end. But you know, I went there, at the beginning he was lying down in bed, and then suddenly he got up. And he, his will to live was incredible. He, he was doing laps around the, the hospital, speaking to people, and that value for life, um, I think, is is a very important lesson for me to learn. You know, in a, in a generation where, you know, um, very low self-esteem is like a plague of low self-esteem, and you know, abortion is starting to become, you know, a more accepted euthanasia. Um, you know, all these things. You know, it's just a lack of appreciation for life and. I think what, what he did was that even though, you know, coming out of the hospice, you know, how productive are you going to be? How, how much can you do? You know, he's still going to be dependent on people for all different things which he won't depend on, on them beforehand. But he fought because life, because he, he valued life. Life was a, a very valid, valuable thing to him. Um, and, you know, so what I take from that is that no matter how hard, you know, life gets, it's a, it's a big merit to be just to be alive. There's huge worth in that, just to be alive. Um, and, you know, everyone has their struggles, everyone has you know, their, own, their own baggage. But the fact that I'm alive is, is an amazing thing. Um, and I think that's what I got from Grandpa, the fact that you know, he, fought, he fought his way. Even knowing that, you know, what, you know, he, he, went back, he went back home, which was amazing, but he still had to rely on people, he still had to do his thing. But, but he fought nonetheless, he fought nonetheless, because he believed in, uh, in the value of life. So, um, yeah, thank you very much.